He is back after a few weeks away from the podcast. John Garcia Jr., the Director of Football Recruiting for Sports Illustrated, is here today on the Lockdown Bearcats podcast. We're going to talk about Noah Potter. We're going to talk about how that impacts recruiting in the state of Ohio and going forward with two Power 5 programs in the Buckeye State. Wait, I'm sorry. The Bearcats State, the state of Cincinnati. It's coming up on Lockdown Bearcats. Our Lockdown Bearcats. Your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We thank you very much for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen every day. It's free and available everywhere you get your podcasts and on YouTube, so don't forget If you're watching on the Lockdown Bearcats YouTube channel to subscribe, you can also follow us, so that means you'll get an alert every time a new podcast drops. You can also like and share a comment on today's video. If you are downloading from an audio platform, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, don't forget to subscribe there too. You can also like and share a comment on today's video and or give it a rating. All of that helps more Bearcats fans like you find this podcast. My guest today is no stranger to the Lockdown Bearcats podcast. He's the director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated, John Garcia Jr. John, uh, the Bearcats got a huge commit last week in the transfer portal. Noah Potter from Ohio State, former four-star commit. What can you tell us about him and how he will fit in to the Cincinnati Bearcats defensive line? Well, yeah, Alex, I think that was a big deal. No matter how you slice it, I think with, with Noah Potter, this is a kid who's from Ohio, mentor kid. Uh, long time Buckeye commit, obviously was was on that roster for a couple of years. Dealt with some injuries, uh, certainly you know up and down, and, and you you never wish that on anybody. Uh, and a lot of times we're saying, hey, that's a, a nice cause to take a step back and truly evaluate where you're at. And I think for Noah, you know, the writing was on the wall a little bit. Ohio State always talented at the defensive end position. So if it was about making an impact, you know, he started to look elsewhere. Um, and just like we've seen with some other guys from the state of Ohio, when you hit the portal and you start looking around, Cincinnati just starts to look really good. And it was easy to explain when we were talking Corey Kiner, you know, Cincinnati native, all that stuff. But it could be even easier for for a Noah Potter, right? If you're a defensive prospect in particular, Cincinnati has a little bit more appeal. Uh, It's it's kind of the calling card of the program, certainly reflects uh, Luke Fickle, the head coach. And then I know offline we were talking about the NFL draft, Alex. You watch that thing and you say, okay, if, if I go to Cincinnati, I've, I've really got a chance to improve my stock heading into, you know, the, the, the highest level possible. So I think all those factors make a lot of sense uh, for Potter to make this move to Cincinnati. Um, again, I, I think there's a lot of unknown about his game in terms of where it's at today because of that injury. We just haven't seen a lot of him over the last 12 months or so. But before that, we know this is a dynamic and balanced defensive end prospect. I I think in high school, more of a pure edge rusher, a guy who could win with speed, a guy who could win with power and work underneath and develop some technical moves, some combination moves to to counter just the speed rush. Uh, But he was like 245 at that point. You know, I, I checked the Ohio State roster from the spring. He's listed at 275 now. So he's gained 25 pounds of muscle mass uh, since getting into college. And I think that makes his his role potentially at UC that much more intriguing because now he can rush the passer from the inside. I think it's, you know, conventionally, Alex, you take a step back and look at football and you, you notice defensive ends, speed rushers coming off the edge, making big plays, blindside hits. It's great. It's a highlight, glory, all that stuff. But if you talk to quarterbacks and you talk to offensive coordinators, the guys that really piss them off the most are the interior pass rushers, the guys who can rush the passer over a guard or over a center because it's simple math. It's the quickest point to impact the quarterback, which is really what the game of football has become all about on the defensive side. So I think Potter's natural gifts athletically can enable him to rush the passer from a speed and outside perspective, but his weight gain his maturity now uh, through the transfer portal and having to make such big decisions, recovering from the injury, I think that will help enhance his overall value to the UC defense and maybe towards the NFL one day because he could complement that with an interior pass rush. He's big enough to extend and hold the point 
to help secure uh, the front line against the run. But I think where the upside lies with Potter, Alex, is certainly his ability to crash the pocket, collapse it as a pass rusher, working against bigger, maybe slower guys than he's ever worked against, uh, you know, usually working against some offensive tackles. So guards and centers a little bit smaller, a little bit wider, a little bit more ingrained and in, in sitting back on their heels. And that's that's lunch sometimes for, for guys like Noah Potter. So I think it's a fresh start that that really helps everybody in this situation and, and bolsters what we always expect to be a, a strong uh, UC defense along the way. So you mentioned, and you and I talked about this before we came on, uh, nine Bearcats drafted this past um, NFL draft, which is still absurd to me. And um, six of those players were from defense. So what does this say about a player? And we talked about this with Corey Kiner, John. A player, you know, who's at Ohio State and this highly sought-after recruit in high school, if it's not working out from him, he can go to Cincinnati. I mean, four years ago, you would go to Cincinnati if you just want a playing time. Now you're going there. It's like, hey, I need to go here so I can become an NFL caliber prospect. What does that say about the Bearcats football program and how far it has come in terms of recruiting and who they're getting in the transfer portal? I think you said it right there. It used to be kind of a uh, something you settled for, right? Cincinnati was something you settled for in the recruiting process to a degree. And now it's something that you ascend for. It's like a priority in the process. You know, Cincinnati, for better or for worse, over the last decade is really judged from a recruiting standpoint in how it competes for power five level players. Um, so anytime there was a win there, it was this this huge spotlight moment because you beat out a Big Ten team or an ACC team, what have you, for, for a recruit. Well, now it's happening on a very consistent basis. Uh, and then, of course, Cincinnati will be in the Power Five here relatively soon. So I think Cincinnati's just become its own thing, where it's like not only can you play Power Five football in Ohio outside of Columbus, uh, but there's a proven track record. You know, the first non-P5 school to make the playoff, the NFL draft success, the development of, of defensive prospects, the stability under Luke Fickle, which is really the most unique thing of all of those. I think the playoff is an easier sell to, to folks. But for me, especially, again, last year was nuts, right? All these coaches changed jobs, even coaches who we thought were at great gigs that they didn't need to leave, right? Brian Kelly leaving Notre Dame, Lincoln Riley uh, leaving Oklahoma, even Mario Cristobal leaving Oregon, coaches left great, you know, championship level gigs for others. And yet here's this group of five school in Cincinnati that has a coach that everyone knows about and that everyone has has recognized as one of the best, you know, up and coming trajectory coaches in the business. There he is, Luke Fickle, just sticking around at UC. I mean, I thought that was among the, the most surprising elements of last year's coaching carousel. Um, and I think that stability there sells with him as much as anything else uh, the UC program can offer. And I think that's, again, part of the reason why Noah Potter felt like, hey, this is this is a great move for me. If I'm going to refresh and restart somewhere, why not go across the state where things have been, you know, in the last 12 months, things have been better than they were at Columbus. And even the fact that that's a possibility uh, would be an upset. If, if you talk to somebody who's been in a coma for a couple of years, you'd be like, what? What do you mean Cincinnati's had a better 12 months? It's absolutely true. And I don't think it's relatively close. Um, you know, playoff, <laughs> fickle, draft. I mean, the whole thing has, has worked for Cincinnati relative to OSU. Most recently, obviously, you expand that over and, and things change. But the whole point is, is that Cincinnati's stability is something that it can now sell when before it was kind of kind of a launch pad, right? You think of the coaches that have stopped in at UC and they vaulted that into bigger jobs over the last, I don't know, my whole life. That's been a thing. Uh, and now it appears like for the first time where it's it's kind of not a thing. And, and that's great news and great timing for the Bearcats as, as they head into the Big 12. John, you have set the stage for a lot of points and questions I want to ask you about um, after this word from Built Bar. And you may have given me a topic for tomorrow's show on Friday. So uh, this is why I enjoy having you on. I know a lot of other people do on this network. So uh, I'm going to ask you about the, the Power 5 aspect and, you know, about Luke Fickle and about the 2018 recruiting class for the Bearcats that recently got some huge recognition uh, nationally. But first... I got to ask you all listening to this, John, too. You see, I love brownies, but you know what I love more? Brownie batter. That's true. 
Sometimes I eat half the batter just while I'm making the brownies. I actually eat half the bag of chocolate chips, too. So imagine if you could lick that brownie spatula clean and get some protein in. What? Well, it's true. You see, you're in luck because Built has a new creation, and this one's better than ever. The brownie batter puff. Yup, you heard me right. This puff takes protein bars to a whole new level, and they're available right now on Built.com. All Built Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate, but they only have 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only 7 grams of sugar. So that means when you eat a Built Bar Puff, you can eat healthy and actually enjoy doing it. They're made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently. A doctor did not write that, nor am I a doctor. It also provides tons of health benefits. The brownie batter puffs will have you completely forgetting that you are eating a protein bar. No need to pinch yourself. This is real life. Unlike when you go to a car dealership and it's too good to be true sometimes. Go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen of every day. And for your next listen, check out the Lockdown Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. Alex Frank here with you and John Garcia Jr., my guest, the director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated. So, John, the, the Bearcats, you mentioned they're going to the Big 12. That's been discussed multiple times on this podcast. So now, for recruits in Ohio, for recruits around the country, we've talked about this before too, they now have two Power 5 schools in Ohio that could be coming for them. So how does that impact the dynamic in recruiting, maybe the transfer portal that you now have? Oh, it's not just Ohio State in the Big Ten. And I can go to the Big 12, and that program just made the playoff. As you said, John, the Bearcats arguably have had a better 12 months than Ohio State. Yeah, again, even even as you say it, it's like, wow, it's, it's, it's amazing to, to see the ascent there. But look, uh, I, I know for years, I'm sure you've had to fight against it and others as well in that community. You know, there's there's um, two states of, of looking at the, the power five, right? You look at it as, well, it's just five conferences that feel like they're superior. And then the other side is it's five conferences that are the most superior in college athletics and football in this case in particular uh well now cincinnati fans don't have to do that they don't have to play that game uh, because i do think the latter is true you know conventionally those conferences are where there's more money there's more following there's more value there's more eyeballs there's more everything for the most part in college football so now cincinnati can play right into that after having defended the opposite for so very long and i think when we talk to recruits and i talked to a recruit yesterday about this actually there's certain milestones that you hit, right? Obviously your first offer, that's a huge, you know, you never forget your first, all that stuff correlates over there. But then once you start getting a couple others, you're like, okay, what's my next milestone? And a lot of kids are waiting on that first power five if it didn't start their recruiting process altogether. So that is another natural milestone. And until now, when Cincinnati has offered that part of it, that kind of novelty, a holiday type celebration marker was not associated with Cincinnati Bearcat football and the offer that came down from that program. But now that's just another thing to sell. Like, Hey, we, you know, Cincinnati can and should be the first power five offer for a lot of programs. They're great identifiers of talent, great evaluators. They trust their own evaluations, which is the marker of a great program internally. Uh, so yeah, now Cincinnati could not only be the first big offer, but the first power five offer for certain prospects. And that resonates, Alex. That's something that you do remember. You know, every recruit, I mean, you can go on Twitter right now and just Google, uh, you know, sleep or slept on. And half of the recruits that we talk about will feel like, hey, I'm slept on. I don't have these offers. I don't have that offer, blah, blah, blah. Well, now again, Cincinnati can hold more weight, at least perceptionally, when that offer comes in and that does wonders not only locally right obviously now you can say hey there's not just one power five team in the state i mean people in ohio have been waiting for that just like people in louisiana are still waiting for that people in arkansas are still waiting for something like that where they can counter the lsus and the arkansas of the world well now the ohio states of the world can be countered by, by cincinnati so certainly locally and in state 
it helps a ton. But I think where it could have a bigger impact, Alex, is out of state. Because if you're a kid from Ohio or even Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, you understand what's going on at Cincinnati, right? You're close enough to see it, to kind of feel it. But if you're a kid in Miami or California or Texas, New York, you know, somewhere outside of that Midwestern footprint, now at the surface level, in addition to that recent success, you could say, hey, I, I just got a Power 5 offer. And that resonates even more uh, because those prospects might not know as much about the program. So just opening the door and entering the conversation, Cincinnati will have more weight once all of that stuff uh, is, is officially here. And it, and it kind of feels like it already is. But once it all goes through, it's officially there. So I think from a perceptional standpoint, it really does change a lot of things for Cincinnati. And again, for you and me, that's not a big deal because perception versus reality are two very different things. But for a 16-year-old kid getting his first Power 5 offer, that perception carries a lot of weight and could open the door for a Google search, a follow-up, a visit, so many things that are really important in gaining footing in recruiting, whether it's the first offer or the 50th offer uh, in the process. I mean, it's interesting to think about, John, because the Big 12 come 2023, it's going to be from West Virginia over here to Salt Lake City over here. So you're going to be getting recruits from other parts of the country that you haven't gotten yet. So, John, recently the Athletic, um, Max Olson, ranked the Bear, they, he did a top 25 of the recruiting classes from 2018 revisited. And I remember when I saw the headline, I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, Cincinnati might be on that list. You know, maybe 13, 15, 23. No, 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 no. The Bearcats, John, were number four on the list. Fourth on the list, the Cincinnati Bearcats. I mean, you want to talk about if someone has been living under a rock for five years. Hey, the Bearcats have had a better 12 months in Ohio State. No, what they... What I believe more, I think, is, hey, this recruiting class, John, is the number four recruiting class now from 2018. But what does it say about that class? What does it say? Because that class had MyJ Sanders, Alec Pierce, Josh Wiley, um, Javon Hicks, who's still here, Lorenz Metz. Those are the players mentioned, top signees. And that class got them to the college football playoffs. So what does it say about the class now and the development that Luke Fickle, Brady Collins, and the coaching staff did a remarkable job of doing. Particularly your second point, Alex, the development. I think we, we just talked about it earlier. UC is one of those programs that you just trust from an evaluation standpoint. They trust their own gut. They trust their own eye and have a style in how they evaluate and identify talent uh, before they bring them in. And they'll, they'll run on that before they look at our rankings or somebody else's. And that's good. That's how it should be. Uh, and those names you mentioned, particularly Pierce, my goodness, it really emphasizes that point uh, in terms of recruiting against perception and then actually developing. I mean, you, you think of some of those guys when they were in high school versus where they are now, and some of them are in the NFL now. It's just, it's amazing to see the progress that has been made. I think when we talk about selling things to recruits, which is what recruiting actually is, Cincinnati's got a lot of things going for it. Obviously on the field success, really, really strong coaching stability we talked about earlier. But the most important in the modern recruit, Alex, is, hey, can this school help me get to Sundays? Can I play potentially, if I'm good enough, in the NFL? Can they develop me there? Can they get me there? And that class of 2018, even more in 17, and I would say 19, those classes are showing um, that, yes, Cincinnati is one of those programs where, yeah, you can be developed from a two- or three-star guy, quote-unquote, into an NFL guy. Um, if you, you kind of stay the course, you know, there's there's a lot of modern elements of, of Cincinnati's program. And there's a lot of classic elements in Cincinnati's program that each uh, kind of balance each other out in terms of development, whether it's old school aggression on defense or a more developmental wide open aspect on offense that puts a lot on the quarterback position and visibility on those wide receivers and running backs to get out in space and make big chunk plays, which are now becoming as important as turnovers and in, in trying to figure out who's going to win a given football game. So I do think that Cincinnati offers a lot of that and, and the development in particular is really the key. Um, it's easy to sell, hey, this guy was a five star. He came in, he sat and then he started and then he got picked in the first round and it kind of worked, worked out how we all thought. It's much more theatrical to sell the opposite, where a guy who came in with Cincinnati as his best offer, 
and had to sit maybe two years. But in those two years, he got bigger. And then he got on the field, and then he got better. And his senior year was so good that he did get that same chance to, to crack an NFL roster, which is really what it's become about in, in recruiting. Can I do this professionally? And at Cincinnati, that answer is yes. And it's a stronger and more bold yes than a lot of current Power 5 programs, which is certainly, again, another sign of the trajectory that this program's been on. That's an interesting point about it, it. It's better right now than some than some Power Five schools, and now Cincinnati is going to be in the Power Five conference. John, we'll continue this conversation after a word from two of our sponsors. I want to ask you about what this does for Cincinnati high school football because I've always said it's some of the best football in the country, and I think now that's starting to get some national recognition as well. And I'm going to also going to ask you your thoughts on the potential SEC playoff because I actually like it. We'll be back. We'll be back after a word from two of our sponsors. John Garcia Jr., the director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated. My guest today on Lockdown Bearcats, Alex Frank here with you each and every day. So, John, Cincinnati high school football, I think it's some of the best in the country. And now that you have all these recruits, high star recruits, transfers coming in, the Bearcats just went to the college football playoff. Hell, the Bengals just went to the Super Bowl. I'll throw that in there, too. So now, <laughs> why not? When yeah, uh, I mean, Cincinnati's a pretty good football city right now. It's a football town. On, yeah. So what does this do for Cincinnati high school football? And what are your thoughts on it? Because I there is there is some incredible talent that now with the success of the Bearcats, I think it's going to get more national recognition. Do you agree? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, it just kind of comes with the territory. I think when you think of the best football states before we get into the city, you know, Ohio comes up pretty quickly, right? I mean, it's it's your big four is, is, you know, a given, right? You know, Georgia, Florida, Texas, California. But when you get into that next chapter, Ohio's right there in the mix with Alabama, Louisiana, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. I mean, these are some of the best, you know, football players in the country year in, year out. And I think you've seen uh, schools recruiting it uh, effectively uh, to that perception, you know, Previous 10, 15 years ago, you know, Alabama or Georgia, why would they go into Ohio for a prospect? They didn't need to, right? They didn't think they needed to because they could just recruit that SEC, that classic SEC footprint. Well, now every year it feels like Alabama's going up and, and grabbing a prospect. Um, you know, Clemson comes in to, to grab a prospect. The whole Big Ten, Notre Dame, really prioritizing guys in that state. So, you know, the talent has certainly risen to the top there and then with Cincinnati in particular I mean there are some name brand high schools uh in that footprint that consistently uh turn out big time prospects whether it's Molnar High School St. Xavier I mean there's so many that that come to mind immediately uh in the city in the area of Cincinnati so I, I think that has become more of, of an uptick relative to Cleveland which I think from a perceptional standpoint was was kind of viewed you know certainly with Glenville and some of those schools as as the area in the state, you know, that that has certainly changed just like it should. I mean, a lot of these footprints have changed in terms of top talent. Uh, and certainly when you're when you're two power five programs in state or Ohio State and Cincinnati or Cincinnati and Ohio State, as I'm sure you'll put it. I mean, that's a big deal that matters in, in recruiting that matters in where kids want to go to high school, because we always talk about recruiting in college. But Look, a lot of these private schools, a lot of these smaller schools, they, they are recruiting middle school kids into high school. So when those kids and those families have to make those decisions, it does help when the, the high profile programs in the state at the collegiate level are doing so well. It just kind of pushes them over the top. I mean, Alex, think about kids that are on the border of Ohio, right? Think of some of these border towns. I mean, if you have your, your choice, like a lot of the kids do relative to, to their districts, you're probably going to play in Ohio a little bit sooner than you play in, in, in some of the other border towns or border states, I should say. So I do think that stuff ultimately matters because, again, perception with youth is a really big deal, and this only elevates all of it. I'm going to spare you of saying the word Cleveland on a Cincinnati-based podcast, John, <laughs> but I'm, I know we're talking about Ohio and Cincinnati high school football. I'll spare you that, but um, – in the wise words of Sam Weish, we don't live in Cleveland. We live in Cincinnati. I, I, John, I know you got to run. You got a lot of other interviews with uh, multiple other colleagues on the Locked On Podcast Network College channel. But real quick, the SEC maybe going to implement a you know interconference playoff 
after the regular season. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, look, it's hard to argue against more football. I do think some of these conference schedules and the, the classic layout is a little bit old school. And in the SEC in particular, my gosh, the SEC West has been so dominant comparatively uh, to the East. I mean, just think of this year. I was talking to somebody about this. You know, Auburn, which, you know, won a title in the last 12 years, went to another title game in the last 10. They could finish last in their division. And I know things aren't great over there relative to some other schools, but it feels like that shouldn't even be possible. But that's the strength of the SEC West. So once you start breaking that up and allowing a little bit more crossover in general, I do think it helps to balance out those conferences. And, and that way, the, the Western side can have a little bit more parity because, you know, they don't have a Vanderbilt uh, on that side. They don't have a Missouri on that side of the coin like the East does. And and they've been able to beat up on those programs and pad the, the win-loss records for, for a little while. So I do think more balance in general is a good idea. I'm not sure how many more games is sustainable, but, you know, I think one or two won't be the end of the world uh, relative to the, the really pro feel of, of college football nowadays. John Garcia, Jr., Director of Football Recruiting for Sports Illustrated. Always goes in-depth, always brings up great points, and it's great to have you on. John, best wishes to you, and I'm sure that we're going to talk multiple times throughout the summer and throughout the season, which if it can just get here already, I think we'd all be in good hands. John, thank you very much as always, and uh, best wishes to you. Likewise, my friend. Take care. Thank you, John Garcia, Jr., Director of Football Recruiting for Sports Illustrated. My guest today, you can follow him on Twitter. I completely forgot to put my Twitter handle up before the show. You can follow me on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty, and you can also follow John Garcia, Jr. on Twitter at John Garcia underscore Jr. Before we go today, um, I obviously we know what occurred Tuesday afternoon in Uvalde, Texas. And I want to extend my sincere thoughts and prayers to everyone in the community, the parents who, I mean, unimaginable grief. I cannot even begin to think and process what they're going through right now. Um, and Steve Kerr, the head coach of the Warriors, his inter his interview that he gave Tuesday night before his Warriors played the Dallas Mavericks, uh, that is a must-watch for anyone, not just you sports fans, Bearcats fans, anyone Listen to this podcast. And I just wanted to take this time to extend my thoughts and prayers to those families, to everyone in Uvalde, Texas, and just the entire country in general. I mean – what it has seen over the last 10 days, less than two weeks, inexcusable, and it has to stop. It really does. Um, That's going to do it for me today here on Lockdown Bearcats. God, it's already, it's already Thursday. We got one more show. We only got one more show this week. Um, John gave me an interesting topic for tomorrow, Um, and that's on Luke Fick. I've talked about Luke Fickle's transparency. I can now talk about his stability. I mean, it already could before, but I'm going to talk about that. Tomorrow, um, of course, we'll have a fun Friday topic as well. Thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats today and every day your first listen of every day. Now make your second listen, Lockdown NBA Big Board Podcast, Rafael Barlow, Richard Stamen, excuse me, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin give fans an in-depth look, excuse me, into the biggest prospects, the latest player rankings, and, of course, big boards. Follow Lockdown NBA Big Board every day on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. As for me, you can follow me on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty with two N's, N N A T I. You can follow me on Instagram, Alex Frank nine underscore, and email me at Alex three Frank at gmail.com. If you're watching on the Lockdown Bearcats YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe. We're up to 116 and counting. We're not done yet, though, far from it. So hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube so you can get an alert when we drop a new episode. And you can also like and share a comment on today's video. If you're downloading from an audio platform, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast, don't forget to hit that subscribe button there too. You can also share a comment and or give it a rating. All of that helps more Bearcats fans like you find this podcast. For the Lockdown Bearcats podcast, my name is Alex Frank. Thank you for making it. Lockdown Bearcats, your first listen every day. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your Thursday.